Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, yeah, good morning. Um, I'm way ahead of myself. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'll start off by saying it's Alan Goodwin's birthday today. I don't know if you wanted me to mention that, but I happen to know that. So um, happy birthday, Alan. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old he is um, because I don't know. <laughs> but he looks very young and uh, I just want to say thank you for how you've been leading us through this um, effort despite the current crisis that we are going through. Once again, it's good to see everyone. It's um, 11.32 and I see that there are 35 participants. I mean, that's, that's just great. I mean, it's like this is the third one and we keep having a lot of participation, we might just as well keep this going, even after everything, um, you know, gets better than where we are today. But once again, today's conversation will really engage you uh, and, you know, very helpful for you to be all in. And uh, let's hear it from you, uh, your thoughts, your ideas. Um, we really appreciate that. But the conversation doesn't stop even after the meeting ends you can continue to provide information and ask questions and share your thoughts and ideas with us as well um, i'm sure that laura and alan are open to that so once again i really want to appreciate you all and thank you um, you make us better so alan over to you thank you and i noticed that um tony was able to join us by phone tony would you like to say a few things before we get into the presentation um, and Tony, I need to unmute you, but uh, are you five seven? I'm unmuted now, I think. You're unmuted. Can okay. you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, thank you, Alan. Thanks, Ty. Um, uh, I will be brief, but I just want to uh, thank everybody for their ongoing uh, time commitment to this. Um, it's so important to Charlotte, and in, indeed, it it's going to help set a tone for our entire region. I was in another meeting this morning uh, with some regional uh, some leaders from around the region and uh, just talking about the importance of collaboration like this. And uh, so uh, on so many levels, it's really important what we're doing and the time and effort that you all are giving. And uh, I'd like to remind you of the importance of going back into your communities and your spheres of influence and letting folks know about this and uh, how it's going. So again, thank you for all that you're doing. Thanks, Tony. And before we um, move on, I know a couple of you have uh, phoned in and uh, okay, I see that Tracy just renamed herself, but um, just so we can uh, put a name to a number, if you will. Um, 980233, I think somebody just renamed them. So, this is Dave Wiggins. Hey Dave, thank you, we're good now. So um, let's get into the presentation. Um, and today we'll be talking about industrial zoning districts. It's our primary topic um, for today's presentation. And the past two Zoom meetings, we've spent a few slides talking about all the features of Zoom and how to do this and that. And I think by now, um, if you've been here for the last couple of meetings, you know how to work Zoom or you've probably used it in your own home lives. So we're not gonna go through the Zoom 101 slides again but uh, I do have this one slide just to remind you that we'll be taking your questions and your feedback as we go um, through the slides via the chat feature on Zoom. So uh, you should be able to find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I see some of you have already given me some birthday wishes. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. But we'll be monitoring the chat window uh, for your questions and comments. And then periodically we will stop and we'll address those uh, questions and comments. So that's all we're gonna say about Zoom, I think. Um, just another reminder that uh, we will have a video recording of this meeting 
uploaded to our Charlotte UDO YouTube page, and you can see the link um, there on the screen, or you can just uh, Google it or go on the YouTube and look for Charlotte UDO, and you'll um, find that within a day or two after the end of today's meeting. Um, again, um, these are just the procedures that we've just talked about. We're uh, uh, Alicia Osborne from our comp plan team, uh, as well as uh, Laura Harmon and I will be uh, narrating today's slides and uh, periodically we'll stop and take your comments and questions via chat. So um, here is our agenda and at this point I'd like to turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Alan. Um, we're excited to actually be digging even further into zoning and giving you guys um, an overview of the first three zoning districts that um, we're proposing. And again, this is really an overview, not the only time you'll see this, and we're actually going to give you guys a lot of um, follow-up information and um, requests and feedback after the meeting. Um, so this is just going to kind of give you a high-level idea of um, what these districts are, what they're um, based on. And so we have um, three districts again. One is IL, our Light Industrial District, IG, our General Industrial District, and INU, our Industrial Excuse. Um, and Hopefully all of you got a chance to look over the information that was sent off on place types. That is a component of the comprehensive plan. And so it's a really important foundation uh, for a lot of the UDO and particularly for our zoning districts. And we're pleased to have Alicia Osborne, who is the project manager for the comprehensive plan. Here to just give you a brief overview on the place types. Um, and again, we're as a group focused on the zoning regs and um, she'll be able to tell you guys if you want to input on place types, uh, what process that will come out of. So we're really not, we're really trying to give an overview today, um, but focusing most of our time on the zoning districts that come out of the two place types she's gonna review. Um, and so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Alicia. If I can unmute myself first before I start talking. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Laura and Alan, for um, allowing me just to set the stage and um, reshare the information that we talked about in our previous meeting. Again, um, my name is Alicia Osborne, and um, along with a really awesome team, I'm helping to lead the Comprehensive the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan, where we are creating a shared vision for growth and development throughout Charlotte. And so um, this is not a new conversation, but um, definitely one to, to have about how the vision um, that we're working on will help influence the, the implementation. And so this slide simply just talks about how um, the, the comp plan will share or create a vision for where we grow and the implementation tools We'll talk more about how we grow. Next slide, Alan, please. So a new tool that we're introducing in the plan, and we've talked about it for some years prior to me coming back to the city, is place types. Um, and it simply makes a stronger connection um, between land use, our built form, mobility, and some quality of life um, characteristics that we are really um, focusing on in how we grow as a city in the future. Next slide. So the place type palette that we're currently looking at has about 10 place types and they range from intensity starting with our parks and preserves, our green um, area, our green infrastructure throughout the city to our most intense areas, which is our uh, community activity centers and our regional activity centers, like Uptown. Next slide. The way we organize how we're going to talk about and how we've been having these discussions with our community is we started with work, which is um, work, live, and play, which is kind of three big categories. The work category speaks to more of where our employment, center are, um, our employment centers are. Live is where our neighborhoods are, where our people live, and play is where we all come together. 
So it's not just um, parks and recreation centers, but our activity centers, where we all come together. Next slide. So the workplace types, there are four in this category. Two of them we will discuss today. Um, commercial, campus, light industrial, mixed use, and general industrial. Um, I hope you guys had a chance to really look at our virtual meeting exercise that we uh, released to our strategic advisors and um, ambassadors, but you all are welcome to participate in that exercise. And I posted the link in the chat, chat box in case you haven't had a chance to participate. That's a way for you to take your time, really go through the place types, really look at some examples and help us to understand are we missing any elements or characteristics in these place types as we move forward. Next slide. So these are some of the major characteristics that are on the full, uh, on the place type sheets. Um, generally speaking about the goal and for the general industrial place types and the light industrial, we're looking at the economic vitality, the places that are really focused on employment and a range of industrial uses. Um, the next component is um, specifies the land uses within these place types. And for this one, it's manufacturing, research and development, warehousing, distributions, and other similar uses. And the character of those buildings, as you know, um, is a little different than some of the other parts of our community. They typically are large in scale, low rise buildings, and have a different type of street network, but we're encouraging some green infrastructure to accommodate that as well. Next slide, Alan. The biggest difference between the last place type and this one is that um, the light industrial mixed use really is introducing that transition to um, for uses, adaptive reuses similar to what we see with our breweries like at Camp North End or um, some other parts of our community that are changing. We wanted to make sure we accommodate um, that uh, opportunities for transition in our community for those. Next slide. So moving forward um, in the schedule, we are now in May of 2020, we'll continue to work with our stakeholders and the community to refine policies and strategies to really take a deeper dive into the place types in hopes of producing a public draft document by October and hopefully um, plan review and adoption in April of 2021. If you have any questions, um, also in the chat box is my email and Kathy Cornett's email. You can email us directly for additional questions or comments. Thank you, Alicia. Um, not seeing any questions for Alicia on place types, but if you do, um, please use the chat box and the next time we stop and um, pause to respond to questions and comments, we'll address those. So what I'm going to do now is take you into the um, draft zoning districts. Um, we are going to talk about the three industrial zoning districts um, that will come out of the two industrial place types. And what you'll see today is an early look at these zoning districts. We're still in draft form. We're still uh, getting feedback, looking for your feedback. So we're going to go through um, the light industrial, the uh, general industrial, and the industrial mixed use. We're going to show how the place type policies and recommendations um, influence and inform our zoning districts. But again, keep in mind this is an early view. You're going to be seeing more polished versions of all of our zoning districts later in the process, but um, this is how we're uh, trying to stay on schedule by giving you an early look, getting some feedback, doing some uh, homework behind the scenes and then rolling out a more polished version for you to uh, look at. So as I said, I'm gonna cover the light industrial, the IL, and the general industrial, the IG districts, and then we'll pause for uh, some feedback and respond to any comments or questions. And then Laura will go through our um, industrial mixed use district. So these two districts, light industrial and general industrial, um, are derived from the general industrial place type. So as Alicia just talked about, we've got a place type that we'll be mapping out uh, over time that will be general industrial. And we're crafting two uh, industrial districts that are appropriate for use in that place type. You can 
almost equate them to our current I-1 and I-2 uh, zoning districts. They, they will be very similar in standards, um, have some differences in use. They are, um, they're kind of the, on the other end of the spectrum from TOD, which is what a number of you have helped us uh, craft. And TOD had a lot of design standards and it was very pedestrian oriented. You're going to see that the light industrial and general industrial districts are, uh, don't have a lot of that in the, in the way of design standards. And, and they're not as focused on that because they obviously uh, are a very different type of place and a very different type of zoning uh, requirements accordingly. So um, the, the goal of the, um, like, uh, the general industrial place type is to provide for a range of employment opportunities for industrial uses. And then our light industrial zoning district uh, would be more like the I-1 district that we currently have and the I-2, the general industrial or the heavy industrial uh, would be for areas that have more of a, an impact in terms of uh, hazardous conditions, noxious conditions, you know, more of a traditional uh, down and dirty industrial um, type of place. So as we go through the slides, um, what I've tried to do is on the left-hand side of the screen, select some place type policies that then inform what our zoning uh, requirements are or, or draft requirements will be. So, um, for example, our uh, place types have some recommendations for land uses, and we will be providing you with the draft of our use matrix for the three industrial zoning districts, as well as a, um, some concepts for some prescribed conditions that go along with some of those uses. So the first zoning standard we'll get into, and I was like, we're not gonna cover every single uh, zoning standard. We are kind of hitting them at a high level. Um, there are a few that we're not gonna cover, but we'll try to do uh, as much as we can. But for example, we do have some um, dimensional and design standards. That's the section we're going to start out with. And the first uh, part of that is our lot standard. So this would be the area that you would typically have a minimum lot area, minimum lot width, density, building coverage requirements, and that type of thing. We are not um, applying or recommending applying any of those with the exception of the minimum lot width requirement of 50 feet. Other than that, we are not proposing any of the, those other requirements be applicable to our two um, industrial districts. Um, the character of these areas are large parcels with buildings placed on the interior. So um, typically these are very large uh, lots uh, with, um, with buffers around uh, the edges to buffer from adjacent uses. Um, setbacks is what we'll cover next. And because um, our place types talk about the buildings typically being located further away from the street. And this is where the contrast with TOD is very apparent. If you think about an industrial um, park or a business park or an industrial use, um, buildings are typically set further back from the street. Whereas in TOD and some of our urban districts, we expect the buildings to be brought up closer to the street. So our setbacks are gonna be very different. So on the frontage, our minimum setback is uh, 40 feet. So that means that we would want buildings in these districts set back at least 40 feet from the back of the curb. Uh, side yard and rear yard, not uh, as much. And so these can be minimal unless they're abutting a residential district, in which case they, they increase to 20 feet. Our building height. Uh, we don't have a minimum building height in, this, in these two districts. Um, place types recommends or suggests that the typical building is a high base single story manufacturing or warehouse. Doesn't mean it has to always be single story, but that is typically what you were, are likely to find. Uh, our maximum building height in these two districts will be 50 feet. 
Uh, building form, unlike TOD, where we had a lot of building form requirements because we were very focused on what those buildings looked like and how they related to the public realm and the pedestrian environment, we are not as concerned in these two industrial districts with um, those uh, requirements. So um, we are not recommending any applicability for maximum building length or transparency or blank wall or, the, or minimum ground floor height or that type of thing. One thing I would note though on maximum building length is that we still have an expectation that uh, new development will build the, the uh, adhere to the recommended maximum block length. So uh, the building length would naturally be limited by the length of the blocks that are created with new development, but we're not recommending, unlike TOD, a maximum building length. Um, again, with design standards in TOD, we had a lot of design standards with uh, the industrial districts that we're talking about. Um, Place Types recommends that we have entrances on the street side of buildings to provide pedestrian access from the public sidewalk and that we have some ability to access buildings from the public realm. But um, since these buildings are typically further back from the sidewalk, the only requirement that we are envisioning here is that at least one pedestrian connection on street facing sides of the building be connected to the public uh, sidewalk with a connection, with a pedestrian connection. Uh, parking and loading. Parking in these two districts would typically take the form of surface parking. So um, we don't have particular standards for um, the design of parking structures other than to use some good um, design practices for parking structure design in the event that new development would uh, select to build a structured parking facility. We would, uh, we do have some design standards for that parking structure. They are not as um, detailed or as stringent as the uh, parking structure design requirements that we used in our TOD districts, but they are uh, good solid design requirements, best practices for um, screening of cars and so forth in a parking structure in the event that a parking structure is built in one of these two industrial zoning districts, which again um, is not going to happen quite uh, very often in our estimation. We still want uh, pedestrian connectivity. So um, our place types indicate that we should have a clear and direct pedestrian access between the streets and the buildings. And so our pedestrian connectivity requirements are quite similar to what they were in TOD, meaning that there needs to be both internal and external sidewalk connections between the building and the street and between the building and then facilities within the site like um, parking lots, uh, multi-use trails, greenways, um, bicycle facilities and so forth and that these pedestrian uh, uh, connections be well lit so they can be safely used at night. Um, open space in these two districts will uh, not be all that common. Uh, if it does occur, it would probably be for the use of employees and the things like uh, picnic areas, walking trails, uh, patios and courtyards, but public open space is not that likely to be uh, to occur and therefore uh, our zoning will have no minimum open space requirements for either of these two districts. Um, as I said before, parking would typically be provided on surface lots. Um, we would allow parking between the building and the street unlike in what we would allow in a lot of our urban districts, um, but it would be limited to the spaces needed for customers and employees. Loading docks and storage should be located to the side or rear of the building. We realize that for these uses, there will be a need for those types of things, loading docks and vehicle storage and so forth. Um, so we will have some parking requirements. The one requirement in the table that you see is that we won't have a parking maximum uh, recommended for either of these districts. Other than that, we will have uh, minimum parking, we'll have parking uh, 
uh, location requirements, we'll have bicycle parking requirements, uh, loading requirements, and so forth. Um, our landscaping and screening our requirements are um, indicated there. We will have requirements for screening of parking lots, parking structures, loading areas, buffer yards, um, trash containers, that whole thing will, they will have to be screened in these districts. Um, I want to mention that some of these things like landscaping and screening and parking will be separate from the, the actual zoning districts and they'll go into a general development standards section of the UDO, which we've talked about before, but I am pulling these out of the general development standards just to show what those requirements would be or proposed to be for these industrial zoning districts. Um, they aren't the only general development standards, and so we'll be looking at all of the general development standards at some point with you at a future time, but I wanted to pull out a, a couple of them. And as I mentioned before, we have other uh, requirements, design requirements that we haven't gone through uh, in these slides, but um, you will see them when you uh, get copies of the zoning district, and we're going to send those to you later. So um, that covers what I've got to talk about in terms of the zoning districts for light industrial and general industrial. I see in the comment section that we have some comments. So give us, um, give Laura and me a couple of uh, seconds to um, look through these and respond. And Laura, if you're looking at these as well. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in with the first one, Alan, and uh, reading it out and we can both respond. Um, this is from Walter Fields. Um, it says, typical isn't a standard. Will the final version have specific standards? It seems like a lot of land on an industrial site that can't be used. Um, yes, you all will be getting the actual first draft language or first OAC draft language um, that we'll be looking for comments from you guys. And so we'll be sending that out. It'll probably go out tomorrow with a number of other resource documents that go with that. And you will see very specific standards in there. If we um, spent time going through all of the specific standards in here, we might be um, spending a few more hours on a pretty dry discussion. So we wanted to really give you guys an overview and an orientation um, so that the standards when you see them um, will make sense. Um, and as you look at the standards, I, I don't know that you'll find that there is a lot of land on an industrial site that can't be used. Um, so we can compare that. I, I know you're familiar, Walter, in particular, and a number of you with our current standards. Um, a lot of the, the setbacks and so forth are, are essentially what we have now. Alan, you want to get the next one? Yes. Um, Jim asked, uh, what other kinds of parking is there other than employees and customers? That is a pretty good question. Um, there could be truck parking. We could have, you know, truck parking that wouldn't, that would be aligned with the business. And then we also have, um, by the way, Arista Stringis and Chris Jeanette from Camiris and maybe ask them to jump in on that as well. Um, other kinds of parking? Yes. Um, I think, I mean, that really would, the other kinds of parking that would be on site would be, based, like you said, truck parking in the industrial. I mean, it really is uh, separating those two and then, it, you know, different standards that apply then to loading and truck parking within the industrial districts. But that's kind of a, a bigger conversation in the parking conversation we need to have on this. Thanks, Arista. Yeah, let me take the, the next question also from uh, Jim Merrifield. It would be helpful to understand how these new proposed standards differ from the current zoning requirements. Um, well, um, you can do your own comparison. You've got, you know, the current industrial zoning is obviously uh, available. And one, uh, I don't know that we've we've taken the time to do this comparison ourselves. I know that when we were drafting 
the uh, standards for these industrial districts. We did so with a lot of our current um, zoning team and we talked about what the current standards allow and, and I think we feel that we're comparable in a lot of areas, but we haven't done a point to point direct comparison to see exactly how we differ from our current standards. Laura, you wanna add anything to that or Shad? Yeah, and Chad could probably speak to the specifics. I think that's something um, as a follow-up and, and if people want to see that going forward, that we could do at a pretty high level. We probably can't do it if you look at the number of standards current in our current regs um, versus this. But we, on some of the key components, I think we could certainly um, look at providing that. So I'd like to hear um, feedback either through chat or in the future, if that would be helpful. I say that with the caveat of um, these two districts that Alan has gone over, I think we can see a pretty direct comparison. The next district that I'll talk about, the IMU, there isn't a direct comparison, so there really wouldn't be anything to compare it against. It's really kind of a new concept. Yeah. Um, I'll take Nate's question about the pedestrians walking through industrial sites. Um, the, the pedestrian connectivity requirements that we are envisioning are, are for employees and users of the site. They're not, we're not trying to promote public access to industrial sites. So when I said pedestrian connections, um, yes, there will be a required connection from the public sidewalk to an entrance of the building. Um, but other than that, the other pedestrian connections that are internal to the site are generally to be used by employees and users of the industrial facility to get from parking lot to the building or from the building to any open space or, or facilities like that that are on site and not necessarily for the use of uh, the, the general public. Hope that answers that. Uh, if you want to follow up with another question, be happy to do that. And then um, Warren is asking that, uh, or wants to know if he understands correctly that both the light industrial and general industrial zones are proposed to be used for the general industrial place type. Yes. Um, if so, it appears to create a communications challenge because general will mean something different between the place type and the zoning district. It would make more sense to all the place type simply industrial. Um, well, I, I guess I'll start by saying that our place types and our zoning districts are not always going to have the same names. And so I wouldn't get too hung up on the place type being called general industrial. Uh, we do that to differentiate it between the other industrial place type, which is light industrial mixed use. Uh, some of our place types will have multiple zoning districts that would be appropriate to be used there. They may not always be called the same thing. It does give us some ability to look at uh, specific locations within a general industrial place type to determine whether a light industrial or general industrial zoning district would be uh, the most appropriate to be used. Um, I'll invite other others to jump in and tackle that one as well, if anyone wants to. I, I'll just jump in and say, I think that's a good point and um, something we can certainly talk about on our end. Um, I, we've noticed that and struggled with it a bit too. So um, thank you for making that comment and let us kind of take that back and think about it. Okay. Um, Brent, uh, Gilroy's got the next question. Will the height limit be flexible? Um, might be some industrial uses that require a silo or whatever, and it might need to be a bit taller. Yeah, actually, Brent, that's a good point, and we did consider that. I didn't include it in the slides because it is a footnote, and it kind of gets in the weeds, but we have thought of that. And so um, I will read that footnote that's in the actual ordinance, which you'll uh, get copies of. Um, yes, even though we have a 50 foot height limit, we have a footnote to that that says any structures integral or integral to the operation of the use, such as the smokestacks, cooling towers, water towers, et cetera, 
that exceed the maximum height of the district are permitted but must be set back from any lot line that abuts, <clears throat> excuse me, a residential district, a distance equal to the height of the structure. Um, this does not apply to any wireless telecommunications facilities or broadcast facilities, which are regulated separately. So what that means is that yes, if a industrial use has got a, um, a need for something that's integral to their operation, such as a smokestack or a cooling tower, they can, that structure can exceed the 50 foot height limit, say it's a 100 foot cooling tower, um, but it has to be um, at least 100 feet from our side or rear property lines if um, it abuts a residential district. So yes, you can go taller, not for the entire structure, but for those elements, um, those individual elements such as a smokestack or a water tower. So yeah, we did think of that, and that's similar to what our current um, district allows, I believe. Um, why do we need a height limit at all? Well, that's a good question that I, you know, that's more of a, I don't know. Laura, anybody? Um, well, and as we said, we are using the place types as our baseline, and we have um, in the place types that guidance. And so um, for the types of uses and so that there's a clear expectation of what will, what will occur in these areas, um, the place types do provide us um, with height guidance. Um, and then uh, Carmela, post-COVID-19, um, will we encourage creative uses like mixed use and future empty light industrial sites that could be creatively used or reused? Um, well, certainly our light industrial mixed use would accommodate those kinds of uses. I, I'm, not, I'm not certain that we've actually talked specifically about that in our light industrial districts. But I think that's... Alan, I, I think that is a, a really good point. I think we want um, a certain kind of compatibility in there. I think it'll be interesting when folks look at the industrial mixed use, um, if, if Carmela and others feel like that is really addressing this issue. I mean, we're hoping that it is, because we're thinking that that is a great place to have a real mixture of uses, um, in, including those creative uses. Um, but as you look at this, um, let us know when we get into more detail. Yeah. Um, the next comment is that uh, the current I-1 and I-2 setbacks are 20 feet. And yes, my slide did say that the um, frontage setback in these two districts is recommended for 40 feet. Um, the difference is that the current I-1 and I-2 setbacks are measured from the property line or the right-of-way line, and um, future setbacks in the UDO will be measured from the back of curb or future back of curb. So um, if you 20 feet measured from the property line and 40 feet measured from the back of curb uh, may in a lot of instances be about in the same location. Um, because the, uh, the right of way or the property line is typically um, behind um, the back of the curb. So um, I don't think that we're suggesting that the future uh, setbacks in industrial districts be any further back than they are today. It's just a different way of measuring. Laura, do you want to take the next few? Um, sure. Uh, Peter Kelly um, asked, should there be more stringent environmental standards, um, e.g. impervious surface and runoff? And I guess one thing that we, we probably need to um, keep reiterating, because it's, it's in our, the UDO team's heads, but maybe um, we're not conveying it um, well enough to everyone, is that there will be other standards for some of these items in other parts of the UDO. So the, um, 
whatever the new version of the post-construction stormwater that deals with runoff and um, impervious surface built upon area um, will still be part of the ordinance. Um, it just won't be in the zoning component. Um, and from Dick Winters, if a parcel is on or includes a creek that is a possible future greenway, will there be a requirement for an easement or buffer to accommodate it? Um, and actually the way that this is treated right now is a greenway would be what we talked about, um, I think it was last meeting as a frontage. And so there is an additional setback off of that greenway. Um, not necessarily an easement or a buffer, but um, a, a separation. Um, you want me to grab the next one, Alan? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, from Keith McVeigh, um, is 50 feet a maximum height that cannot be exceeded? Amazon Warehouse recently completed on Wilkinson Boulevard has multi-levels and may um, exceed 50 feet. So the way this is written, other than um, some of the um, ancillary components that Alan talked about, other is, uh, the other ancillary components that Alan talked about, um, the max would be 50. So that would be really helpful. And we will go back and look at the height of that warehouse um, because we certainly want to make sure we're accommodating those kind of uses. Yeah, my recollection is that we did look at the Amazon warehouse on Wilkinson and it was in the 50 foot range, but you know, we'll take another look at 50 feet is the is not the right number. Um, that, that's kind of feedback we need to hear. Yeah, um, and, and I'd say if when folks are reviewing this in the feedback, if you know of, of truly industrial buildings that are um, higher than 50 feet, that would be really helpful if you could give us those examples. Uh, Eric says the key will be on how this gets mapped. Yes, um, how will these districts connect with other zoning like TOD? Setbacks being different, we'd like to see the streets mapped. Um, yeah, I, I think I understand. Well, yes, we agree. The mapping uh, won't actually take place until later date. So it will be um, Few months before the mapping occurs uh, after the adoption of the comp plan, if I'm correct, Alicia. Uh, how will they connect with other zoning like TOD? I'm, I'm not quite clear, Eric, on what you're asking. You mean where a TOD district is adjacent to an industrial district? Um, there will be buffer requirements between industrial districts and less intense districts like residential, residential. don't know that there will be um, any specific transition between industrial and TOD, which is a higher intensity district, but um, good thoughts. Uh, uh, I think we need to think about that and we will we'll talk about that. And if we haven't, Eric, if we haven't specifically gotten to your point or your question, please follow up with that for us. Um, Nate says, following up on, on the previous comment, um, is UDO redefining how we measure height so it more aligns with the building code? Um, I know that Chad is on. Chad, if you're able to um, respond to how we're measuring height or ARISTA, um, Someone with a little more first-hand knowledge of that, jump in on that one. Um, I don't know if Shad wants to uh, chime in, but I know that as we're, uh, one of the documents you get are definitions. And so one of the things we are working on is, is how we measure building height for the city as a whole. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the details of that because we're still working it out, but trying to make it uh, work a little more little better, a little more consistent, uh, and just make sure that we're handling it correctly. So you will kind of in the future see some um, ch slight changes to how building height is measured uh, in order to be kind of 
more consistent and, and more in line with what you what is in practice rather than in writing. And as you get these definitions, if you guys have comments or thoughts on how they should be adjusted, um, it will certainly, obviously working with Shad and others, take a look at this. So again, we need, you're getting some, some terms, a lot of it we pull from our current regs um, or some new definitions, would love to hear your feedback on this. Okay, um, um, another, Nate has a follow-up comment that you can't rezone for additional height in TOD, that's true. You can only um, get additional height in TOD through our bonus point system, which we are not recommending uh, for use at this time in the industrial district. So how will industrial work for alterations to design requirements? Um, aside from a, a variance uh, application for uh, hardships, I don't know that we envision the industrial districts having, um, I'm sure there will be some administrative capability to make adjustments, but in terms of height bonus or uh, alternative compliance. Um, don't believe that we're envisioning that for the industrial districts. Uh, if there are specific examples that you'd like to provide us that, you know, maybe we need to think about the need for something like that, but um, we hadn't envisioned that. Um, next question from John Morris is on block lengths. Um, he's been confused by the preferred 600 foot block length and a maximum 1000 foot block length when the buildings themselves are often longer than 1000 feet. Why have any block length for buildings with these dimensions? Well, I think existing buildings obviously that are longer than 1000 feet, um, but if it's new development and if Subdivision requires new streets and they have to be a certain block length and that will obviously limit the length of any new building that's constructed. Um, and I want, can I jump in here? Also, the block lengths are in the um, place types. And so you'll, you'll see that in there and it seems like maybe you already have um that would be a great place to give that feedback um because that's kind of setting the standard for what will come out when we get in the fall to our um, transportation and subdivision section um so feedback now through that place type process would be really very helpful all right um Walter Siemens turbine building height. I'm not familiar with the building. Um, the height limit applied to the large tall building on airport property, which is owned industrial. Well, the height limit in, would apply to any new building in an industrial zoning district. That's a, that's a good question. Probably talking about the tower or maybe something else at the airport. So I think ah, something yeah. we need, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but um, that's what comes to to my mind so yes we definitely need to to take a look at that and it's exactly why we're having the conversations so mm -hmm. thank you walter yep um so the amazon warehouse is apparently 70 feet tall um so you may have to look at that uh 50 foot height limit in light of that um information uh, Eric says keeping the walkability and other modes of transportation and other zones are next to each other, especially important with transitioning areas like Wilkinson Boulevard with the Silver Line coming. So um, we agree. I mean, industrial districts will still have, there will be a requirement for um, sidewalks. Um, But yes, we we agree. I mean, I, I don't think we're envisioning that industrial districts are 
not going to have pedestrian facilities as part of them. And obviously, if you abut a different zoning district or a different place type, um, you don't want the sidewalk to end at the zoning line. Um, Matt uh, mentioned the Greenway would be considered a frontage. Will the city be coordinating with Mech County Park and Rec to identify the anticipated Greenway locations? Uh, several have been moving targets. Yeah, that will come from the Greenway Master Plan is what, we're re what we referenced in Todd and what we'll reference in here. But um, we do need to make sure we have enough clarity um, out of that master plan to be able to work with the ordinance. Laura, do you want to keep going and tackle the second uh, half of Matt's question about um, Greenway right of way? Um, also, since NCDOT got in trouble recently by requiring land to be set aside for right of way without compensating the owners, our UDO is requiring a setback from a future right of way for a Greenway that hasn't been acquired. Um, does the city need to provide some additional thought to that? Um, Yes, um, very good point. And I think we're, we're kind of looking at that concept across the board um, uh, as far as at what legal authority we have, to put it um, as, as bluntly as that. So um, more to come on that, particularly when we get to the transportation section. Um, John Morris wants to talk about block lengths. Sure, we'll be glad to do that. We'll get our, we can um, set up a time to do that with CDOT and uh, we'll try, well, we'll see if Mike Davis can participate in that conversation. Um, hangers at the airport. Well, obviously anything that's already built at the airport is going to be legally non-conforming if it, it would exceed the height limit of a new zoning ordinance. But, uh, I don't know uh, about hangers at the airport. I don't know how tall they are, um, how they were built um, under their current industrial zoning. So um, something to, to look into. Um, and another comment about block lengths and Carmela following up on Camp North End. Uh, Camp North End is going to be uh, probably different type of place than the light industrial or, or the general industrial place type. So I think we're going to get into that when we continue on with this presentation. Um, Camp North End would probably be a light industrial mixed use place type, which is going to be quite a bit different in terms of zoning uh, for that. Um, Nate wants to know, will all by right I1 and I2 zoning get correctively rezoned? Uh, so we'll be looking at, um, at how we handle that. It would probably, if we had to guess at this point in time, um, the conventional I1 and I2 would convert, just like we had a lot of conventional TAD converting um, or what did we, what was the word that we used? Um, uh, alignment reason. Uh, yes. Uh, well, before the alignment that, that it actually changed to the new districts when oh, TAD. translated. Yes, they were translated. Yes, translated. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to look at conditionals, though, and see if that's appropriate. If you remember, we didn't do that with conditional TOD, and we may not do that with conditional I-1 and I-2. And in addition, we're going to have to make sure in the long term that where that zoning exists, that that it matches the future place types that will be mapped through the conference of plan process. Okay, I think this is a good time to move on with the presentation. Um, Laura is going to uh, take over and do the second half of our presentation, and then we'll have another opportunity um, after that to uh, get back into our comments and feedback and your questions before we wrap up. So. Laura, are you ready to continue? Uh, yes, and I just, um, with Walter's latest comment, um, with Camp North End, that actually would apply to um, uh, 
probably the industrial mixed use that we're going to be talking about now. So um, just a little bit of perspective on that. And I need the next slide. Um, so this is a new industry, a new industrial type district that's different from anything that we have now and goes with um, the place type that Alicia presented earlier. Uh, so if you look at light industrial mixed use, um, place type that again, that lower intensity um, industrial and employment uses and but also including office research, light manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, and even residential and um, more creative uses such as art studios or breweries. And to implement that place type, we are looking at the mixed use industrial district. I keep getting that backwards, but um, as the new name. Um, so again, um, contributing to Charlotte's economy by providing that um, new mixed use place and the purpose it, as the goal in the place type, the purpose in the zoning um, is to accommodate uh, those areas that typically have been developed initially as industrial areas, but are transitioning from an exclusively industrial orientation to a broader mix of uses and a more walkable environment. Um, Important also that the um, mixed use industrial district accommodates adaptive reuse of existing structures. Um, and you can see, again, some of the, the uses on the left that have converted. So we have a lot of old mills. We have obviously Camp North End, um, but other places like a lot of West Moorhead would possibly um, be appropriate for this district. And as you think about this new district, it is almost like a um, an offspring of taking what Alan just presented in the industrial districts, kind of on the lighter end of that, and TOD. So it's really an urban district, um, but that allows a different set of uses and has some different standards from TOD. Um, again, the uses um, uh, include office, research, development, studios, showrooms, hotels, multifamily, so a pretty broad range of uses, um, and then other uses, retail restaurants and bars, some limited warehouse distribution. Um, uses will be provided, and you all will get this, with um, the use matrix that we'll ask you guys to look at, see if we capture the right uses, um, as well as the concepts for prescribed conditions. Again, um, key component of this is adaptive reuse. Doesn't mean that every building in this district will be um, adaptively reused. We can also um, have uh, new buildings, typically low to mid-rise structures um, and transitioning to vertically integrated uses, ideally, but not always, um, in a pedestrian-oriented environment. And when we look at the um, zoning regs, we're keeping uh, a lot of this fairly open, really, as far as the lot goes. Um, the only item that we have um, put in there with respect to the lot is a minimum lot width of 25 feet, which you'll notice half of what um, we have for the, um, the general industrial districts. Um, building placement, per the place type, buildings typically located near the back of sidewalk. Um, new buildings designed to um, support active uses um, and fairly near the side and rear property lines are allowed to be, again, um, except when abutting neighborhoods and where we're looking at a little bit different concept. So if you look at the frontages, and remember those are streets, but also if you're abutting a public park or a greenway or public path, um, we apply the frontages and they vary from 16 feet to 30 feet from um, the future back of curb, again, tied to that frontage type. We also were bringing back the concept that you've seen in Todd of a build-to zone, an area where a certain percentage of a building would need to be located. Um, and that is between 
zero feet and the area between the setback line and 20 feet behind the setback line. Um, and then for buildings um, that are built along that frontage, um, either 60 or 80%, depending on a frontage type, would have to be in that um, build to zone, um, with the exception of limited access and parkway. So we're really looking more at building placement um, and in these districts than we did in this district than we did in the, the two that Alan went over. And again, fairly minimal side and rear setbacks, except when abutting residential. Um, once again, building form, typically an older industrial structure being reused, but not always because we could have new office, residential, mixed use buildings um, per place types up to six stories. So that brings us um, the building um, height requirements, which are for new buildings. Obviously, if you have an existing building that doesn't meet these, um, there's no way that, that you would have to meet these. But for new buildings, a minimum building height of 24 feet um, consistent with what we had in TOD and a maximum building height of 80 feet. Um, so it, it's a kind of a TOD light. Um, again, talking about block length um, and for new buildings to not um, exceed the preferred block length is something that place types is guiding us to with and also designing buildings so that they are, um, have active ground floor uses, um, tall ground floors and a high degree of transparency through clear glass windows and doors. So we have a new concept that we talked about last time. Well, it's new from Todd. It's not new from what we've necessarily done in our, um, in our regulations in the past but making sure that as we're looking at urban areas along the frontages, we are providing a lot of building um, so that it becomes an interesting place to walk and experience. Um, and we've had that in our old Todd districts, in our head overlay. And this, in this requirement, we're looking at either 60 or 40% um, of the lot frontage having building on um, two of the frontages if you have two. Now if you have three or four it only has to be met with two. Looking at a maximum building length of uh, 500 feet, we have some ground floor transparency standards um, for residential and non-residential which um, I won't read all of that to you and you'll see that in what you get. We also have some upper floor transparency um, standards as well. Again, as I said, in a number of ways similar to Todd, but a bit different. And so we're picking up a lot of the, the standards that have already been approved in Todd and, and tweaking them. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, again, buildings typically not exceeding the per, well, I read that on the left, more information. Um, we have blank wall standards in here, which you'll see when you get the regs. Um, entry spacing for new buildings and um, minimum ground floor height. So greater design emphasis than um, in the pure industrial districts. Um, again, ground floors uh, designed to be active, high degree of transparency, prominent entrances, and you can see the kind of um, design standards that when you dig into this, um, go into more detail, but facade modulation, prominent entrances, meeting grade for entrances, um, and so forth. Um, parking and loading, we're still anticipating in a lot of the cases parking um, in these districts will be primarily surface, but could also occur in parking decks, particularly as they continue to urbanize. Um, so we do have some parking structure design that we provided reference to. Again, um, it's a lighter touch than in TOD that either parking structures are set back or that they do have active uses on the ground floor. If you remember in TOD, we um, 
had, depending on what type of frontage you were on, in some cases you had to have active uses on multiple floors. Um, again, pedestrian connectivity on site is really important. So we have those internal sidewalk connections as well as connections from the building out to the street and an on-site pedestrian system. And this should all look very familiar to you because it is what we have adopted in TID. Um, we are recommending that there be open space in these districts and uh, place types set up for that and different types of open space, but we're really talking about um, the zoning required open space in mixed use industrials. And so all develops, all new development would be required to provide on site open space at um, a minimum of 5% of the total lot area. And then for commercial and mixed use and industrial, a component of that would have to be public. Um, the remainder could be private only for the users of that site. And for residential, it could be entirely um, private. And as Alan talked about earlier, the general development standards, um, we'll be talking about the actual standards later in the process, but to really understand these districts, we thought it was important to give you a flavor of kind of where we would be going with these standards. They won't be in the individual zoning districts, but they'll be in a general development standards component of the ordinance. Um, so for parking and loading, um, we'd be looking at parking lot location, um, uh, probably a minimum amount of parking, may not be, um, should probably be less than what we have now in our regulations overall. Um, we'd also be looking at parking maximums for these districts as they would be more urban. Um, bicycle parking, loading, and valet um, parking standards as well. Um, and then place types talks about transitions, which are really how do you transition from um, one use or type of development to another. Um, and typically in this district would be using landscape buffers to create separation um, and building placement also accommodating those landscape buffers. So um, again, landscaping and screening when needed, being an important part of um, the regulations. So I haven't, as I've been going through this, don't know if anyone has um, has added comments. Maybe Alan, if you could get us started. Start yeah. out. Um, I'm going to the first comment after we uh, started up again. Looks like it is from Warren, uh, and he is making a similar point to a previous comment he made about the name of the place type, including the word light industrial, but the name of the zoning district does not include the word light, it's just mixed use, industrial mixed use. Um, and again, I think, uh, you know, we'll take that comment uh, and discuss it, but again, our, our place type names are not always the same as our zoning district names. Um, we did, uh, I think at one time, Laura, our zoning district, um, we did have the word light in there and we took it out. Um, yes, I think we did, so. Um, we did, it was. Yeah, I it certainly was, understand that comment. It though. was Limu instead of Emu. Um, John, uh, Morris, what's the difference between light industrial mixed use and TOD uh, zoning? Uh, we're doing multiple adaptive reuse projects and TOD seems to work okay. Well, uh, for one thing, TOD is, a, is near transit stations. So um, if there's no transit, um, such as in maybe the case of Camp North End where it really isn't close to um, rapid transit uh, other than, you know, it's close to bus lines, obviously, but it's not close to light rail or streetcar. Um, we would not use a TOD zoning district uh, in areas that were not close to transit. It is very similar. The uh, 
industrial mixed use districts may have um, additional uses that wouldn't be allowed in TOD, um, such as industrial uses, which TOD typically does not allow. So between that and the presence or absence of transit would be two ways that these uh, districts would differ from one another. Yeah, the, the mix of uses also I think we'll find to be different um, and some accommodations for industrial and it, it, that is just not, um, not in TOD and has not been intended to be in TOD. Um, I think this is from um, Thomas, all right, that's kind of a side comment. So let's go to Nate's comment. Um, as many as, as many Camp North Ends as we will see, there will be more Arrowwood Childress Klein large mixed use industrial. I don't know that project, it's Greenfield. Um, all right, so again, um, the industrial mixed use, it, it, it may be a little bit nuanced for, uh, it, it may take us some time to, to get used to it and to figure it out. It, it isn't similar to really anything that we currently have. It may be fairly close in a lot of ways to our uh, recent TOD districts in terms of design standards and some other requirements, although as we said, the uses will be different. Other than that, it isn't, you can't really do an apples to apples comparison with any zoning districts that we currently use uh, the way that you maybe could between the, the new proposed light industrial and general industrial where you can kind of do an apples to apples with our current I-1 and I-2 districts. So uh, proposed IMU district industrial mixed use, there really isn't something out there uh, that you can look at um, as a direct comparison. Um, so it may take us a while to, to get this one, um, get everybody kind of accustomed to figuring it out, where it should be used, um, and, and how the whole thing is going to work. Um, why would residential not have public open space? Well, our thinking, and I'll jump into that one, our current, um, for example, TOD districts um, would require some uh, portion of the open space to be available to the public if you're a, a mixed use development or a commercial or an office development. The thinking on residential, if you're strictly a, a residential community, um, you typically would not open your open space to anyone walking by on the street the way you might if you're a commercial um, project. So, uh, I mean, I think our, our thinking is that open space in a 100% residential development would be strictly for the use of the residents of that development and not for the general public. I mean, I, I think that's generally the kind of feedback that we've always gotten on that. And somebody else wants to add to that. Totally agree, Alan. I, and I think that's the way we set that up, set this up in other districts. Certainly there would be nothing that would preclude a development um, that was purely uh, residential from having a public component, we just didn't feel um, comfortable requiring that. We, um, we've reached the end of uh, our comments and feedback in our chat section. I think we've exhausted all of you with all of the uh, minutia of our industrial zoning districts. Um, we're, we're at the conclusion of our presentation uh, so we can give you a couple more minutes if you want to jump in with uh, a last minute comment. Um, so we can pause here for just a little bit longer if, now Carmela, you, you just, all right, I'm not going to open that right now, Carmela, because I'm not sure what you just put in the comments section. Um, we'll take a look at that later. A new comment from Eric, when transit is added to an area that is zoned as IMU, uh, like say bus rapid transit, would the city then rezone them to TOD? Um, some minor benefit for developers to keep the IMU, uh, like building height and setback. Well, I don't know that introducing 
rapid transit like a bus rapid transit line to an area that's zoned industrial mixed use would automatically um, impel us to or compel us to um, rezone to a TOD district? An interesting question. And I would say we, we're really going to be following the lead of um, the comprehensive plan, which will be updated on a fairly regular basis. So I think in working with the community, um, those discussions will actually be had and there will be um, based on kind of where the community goes and, and staff recommendation and working with the community, a decision would be made before we would simply from a zoning perspective, move that forward. And Carmel, I see your, your um, comment. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to call you out on that. Um, you were trying to save the chat. I'm not, I'm not sure how to do that. Um, if you can't figure it out, I think we are saving um, this chat. And again, this whole meeting will be available on our YouTube page. So you can always go back and replay the video of the meeting. Um, I don't see any more comments. So um, I'm going to suggest then that we move on to our next slide. And I'm going to let Laura go through this one, if you don't mind, Laura. Sure. Um, so following up from this, um, a lot of good feedback that we've captured here, but we know that you are, have just kind of gotten the high level of these districts. So we are going to send you a lot of information. Um, we are actually going to resend to you the place type sheets. Um, the actual early draft of these zoning districts. Um, the, again, the use definitions that you have with a couple of changes based on feedback, very minor changes, but the use matrix also that goes with these two districts. So you could see what uses are allowed as principal, accessory, temporary uses, and some idea of the prescribed conditions that would be developed for that. Um, uh, we'll be um, also sending you the new definitions that will help to interpret this. And I think you guys have had some comments on um, like the height and how we're measuring height. Take a look at that definition and give us your feedback and ideas on how we should adjust that if you think we should. Um, and then as you look through the districts, you're going to find um, that they reference some TOD standards, um, particularly for IMU. Instead of having to go back to TOD, we have pulled those, or actually our great consultants, um, Camiris, have pulled those standards out of TOD and have them in a reference document for you. Hopefully that will make things easier. And then finally, we are um, going to give you a survey and ask for your comments through that survey so that we can start to look at how we um, would be adjusting these districts moving forward. Um, we'll give you two or three weeks to do that because we know that um, this is, we're giving you a lot of information at one time and asking for you to look through that. Um, so, Alan, anything you want to add to that? Um. No, I think you've covered it, but I do want to go back to um, the comments and thank Matt. Um, Matt said that if you want to save all of the comments from the chat box, just select all the chat text, which you can do by control A and then copy that all to a Word document or something like that. So that's uh, a way to do that if you want to just have all of the comments that have been entered into the chat box um, saved for a later time. And actually, I just did that, Laura, while you were talking over that last slide. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you for that. Thank comment. you. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. That was easier than the way I was trying to figure out how to do it. Um, well, uh, again, thank you all for being us, uh, being with us today. Um, Allison, it uh, uh, looks like you're still here. Um, if you'd like to wrap up our meeting, um, well, Actually, Allison, let me just jump in and talk about what's next. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Allison if she's still with us. Looks like she is. Uh, 
and maybe say a, a few concluding words. Our next uh, step along the way will be to get into our campus zoning districts, uh, which will be based on the campus place types. Um, we had a our next meeting scheduled for June 11th. I don't know that we will be ready for June 11th to do that. So that's why we've indicated that the date of our next meeting to talk about campus zoning districts uh, has yet to be determined. Um, but we will get that to you as soon as we uh, know when we'll be ready to roll out campus zoning districts to you. Um, in the meantime, we will uh, look for your feedback via survey or any other way that you give it to us. Um, and Laura, before I uh, ask Allison to jump in, any last words from you? Um, no, other than thank you very much. And um, we're looking forward to continuing to work with you on these standards. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Allison? I just, want, yeah, I just want to say this is great participation today. I really appreciate everyone's time. I mean, this is a lot to digest. It's a lot to um, to go through and there's a a lot of information and I'm glad to hear you know Carmel say that it wasn't too much so that's good I'm glad we're not uh, overwhelming you all but just wanted to say thank you I know a couple of you reached out to me um, uh, during this just say you have some specific things you want to talk about and we'll get that stuff set up um, and meanwhile um, I guess do your homework uh, we're all having at least some of us with children are having more homework than we used to have in the past um, so enjoy the homework, and um, I just wanted to thank you again for your participation and your time. It's extremely valuable as we as we go down this path of developing the city's unified development ordinance. So thank you.